question. Do you like fishing? Yeah. Fishing is a great sport, ain't it? Yeah. Since you've been fishing, and you've caught plenty of fish, right? You know the great feeling of excitement when you catch that fish, right? One of the things that makes fishing such a great sport, it, it doesn't matter if you're young or old. You can still enjoy it. Now, what does it take to be good at catching fish? <laughs> well, first off, you need to have the proper equipment. I mean, you can't tie, take a piece of string and tie a hook on one end and a stick on the other and plan on catching a lot of fish, can you? <laughs> You're going to have to have a lot of patience for that one. But if you're serious about fishing, you'll make sure that you have the right equipment. Real nice pole, good reel, good lures or bait. The next thing you need to know that you have to go where the fish are to catch them. I mean, you can't catch fish out of your swimming pool, can you? <laughs> yeah, that would be good in the first. Finally, if you want to be a good fisherman, you have to have what again? Patience. Patience. Sometimes the fish ain't tight, are they? And you have to wait and wait and wait. Now, one thing that is talked about in our Bible is one day Jesus was walking along the seashore when he saw two brothers named Peter and Andrew. Jesus knew they made their livings by fishing. So he called out to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Do you know what they did? Followed him. They laid down their fishing nets and followed him. Jesus wants you and me to fish for people too. That means that Jesus wants us to tell others about what he has done for us what he wants to do for them. Fishing for people is a lot like fishing for fish. First, we need the proper equipment. We need to know what the Bible teaches and learn how to share it with others. Next, we've got to go out where the people are and tell them about Jesus. And finally, must have patience. If we will do these things, we can really become fishers of people like Jesus wants us to be. If you think there is a great feeling and excitement at catching a fish, just imagine how excited it must be to bring someone to Jesus. Like pray. Dear Jesus, help us become fishers of people. Help us tell others what you have done for us and what you want to do for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go back now. Okay, Asa, just to make everything a little fair, since I always pick on you, now I'm going to give everybody here a test. So see, it's not only you that gets picked on today. Now I'm going to give everybody a test this morning. I'm going to present facts regarding an historical figure from back in the 1700s. And then I'm going to ask you who I'm describing. He was a brilliant general who won several battles for his nation. But over time, this general became angry about how he felt he was being treated. Money was tight and he'd been passed over several times for promotion. Then he hurt his left leg in a battle at a place called Saratoga. Because of his leg wound, 
it was possible that his military career was ended. He became bitter and resentful, and he switched sides, betrayed his country, and began fighting for the enemy. The enemy entrusted this general with 1,600 troops to attack and destroy one of the major cities of the day, a place called Richmond, Virginia. To this day, this general's name is a byword for betrayal and treachery. Now, does anybody know who this general's name is? Benedict Arnold. Arnold. Benedict Arnold. <laughs> Remember, Arnold had destroyed the city of Richmond, Virginia. And during the American Revolution, a Virginian was asked what they would do if they ever caught Benedict Arnold. He replied that they would cut off his left leg that had been damaged at Saratoga and bury it with full military honors. The rest of him, they would hang. <laughs> now, as you can imagine, that final judgment appealed to a lot of American colonists. Benedict Arnold had betrayed his nation out of bitterness and pride. And they felt he deserved to be properly punished. Ultimately, he found that no one wanted him around. The Americans didn't want him, and the British didn't trust him, and he was buried in a forgotten grave. One historian, while hunting for his burial place, found it hidden behind some rubble with lettering painted all over the concrete wall of his crib. Final judgment appeals to us. That's why the last of our favorite verses is all about judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. People like the idea of judgment, not for themselves, mind you, but they find satisfaction that bad people will pay a price. One person noted that God wouldn't be a righteous God if there was not a time when sinners would finally be punished. Mass murderers, rapists, child molesters, crooked politicians, and the list goes on and on and on. Our very essence cries out that there needs to be a day of judgment. Because if there isn't a day of judgment, God could not be a righteous God. And the Bible repeatedly tells us there is going to come a day when everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive what is due for what he or she has done in the body, whether good or bad. Over and over again, the Bible drives that point home. Romans talks of people who are, the they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. And then Paul writes, because of your hard and unrepentant hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. On that day, when according to my gospel, 
God judges the secrets of man by Christ Jesus. Then John wrote, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. The de and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Daniel 12, 2 sums it up with these words. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. There will be a day of judgment because God is a righteous God. And it is so much a part of our message that nearly 80% of America believes we will all be called before God at Judgment Day to answer for our sins. Peter declares Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is our message. There is a coming time of judgment. The intriguing thing is, a lot of people think they're going to get a pass because of their good deeds. They won't have to stand in judgment because they're nice folks. According to a study done in 2007, roughly half of America believes that they will be going to heaven if they are generally good or do enough good things. While only one third believes salvation is obtained only by accepting Jesus Christ. Now, there's a reason for that. And the reason is, this thinking is baked into our thinking. As an example, I'm going to recite a few common American phrases. And you see if you can complete them. We make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There is no gain without. God helps those who help themselves. Everything about the American life teaches us a simple truth. You get what you earn. You get what you work for. You get what you pay for. And there's nothing wrong with that. That should be the American way. We should be responsible individuals who work to take care of our families and contribute to society. <coughs> but the problem is, many people believe they can think about God and their relationship with Him the same way that they think about their paycheck or to their positioning. I should do good things and then get what I pay for. I should earn my salvation because if you paid for your salvation, you wouldn't have to face judgment. But the problem is, that won't work. In the days of Jesus, there was a group of men called the Pharisees. Jesus despised them for the self-righteousness and 
hypocrisy. But they were known to be very meticulous in making sure they did everything right. They felt because of their righteousness that they were a shoe-in to live with God. And Jesus used the Pharisees as a measuring stick of righteousness. Jesus said, unless you are righteous, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the Pharisees were seen as being very righteous people, but even their righteousness wasn't enough to gain heaven. That's another way of saying you can't be good enough to be good enough to get into heaven. All of us, you and me, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us is righteous. Not even one. That's what Romans tells us. And Ephesians 2, 3 tells us that before we became Christians, we were by nature children of wrath. We deserve God's wrath. Like the rest of mankind. And instinctively, we all know that anyway, there are times when the best of us cringe when we remember the bad words, the bad thoughts, and the bad deeds we have done. The guilt and shame of those things can sweep us over like a flood. And we tend to say things like, I hate myself. What the, when that happens, we begin to question whether we're really all that nice. That's why some people are driven to try to pay off bad deeds with good deeds. When Jesus was on earth, he spent most of his time with the folks who had seriously put their lives out of balance. The prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners. These people really realized what a mess they made of things. And Jesus' message deeply appealed to them. To fix this major mess up in their lives, Folks tend to work harder to do more and more good deeds. And they hope that this huge outpouring of righteousness will bring balance into their lives again. But there's a few problems with this theology. First, there's no scoreboard. If you go to a football or baseball game, there's a scoreboard to help you keep track of what the score is. But there's no scoreboard to tell you if you've done enough good to balance out the bad in your life. That's why when many people are asking if they believe they're going to heaven, they respond by saying, I hope so. They don't know if they've done enough to put their lives back in balance and earn a place in heaven. There's no scoreboard. Number two, notice by adding good to the good side doesn't remove the bad stuff from the bad side. All the weight of your past sins are still there. Eventually, there's no room. The scale of our lives only built to handle so much weight. Too much weight is added to the scales. Ultimately, the scales break. People's lives fall apart and they give up hope of ever being able to undo the damage of their past. It's a mess. But God says, let me fix that for you. Let me take the weight off your scale and put your life back together the way it should be. In Revelations 20, 12 through 15, John writes, I saw the dead, great and small, 
standing before the throne. And books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. There's a book of life. If my name is in that book, then I don't have to face judgment. How do I get into the book of life? Well, Peter declares Jesus commands us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. When we belong to Jesus, we receive forgiveness of our sins. God removes the bad stuff from our lives. And we are free from the guilt and shame they could bring. All that's left on the scales are the good deeds in our lives. And God loves good deeds. He just wants us to understand that those good deeds can't save us. The only thing that can save us is God's forgiveness of our sins when we believe, repent of our sins, confess Jesus as our Lord, and allow ourselves to be buried in the water of baptism. God forgive, forgiveness is the only thing that will save us because without it, we face judgment. I want to close with this little story. Many years ago, there was a typical Sunday evening worship service at a certain church. It was just like any other evening worship in thousands of churches across the land. A few faithful folks showed up, but not many. Songs were sung, the sermon was preached, and the close of prayer. And the people made their ways out to the parking lot. What met their eyes as they walked out the church doors shocked them. The parking lot was full of cars with more cars coming down the road. People were on their knees in tears and praying earnestly, exploring for God to, imploring for God to save them. The crowd at parking lot was full of members and non-members. And the hearty band of Sunday night worshipers stood in amazement, wondering what had happened. <clears throat> Why was this happening? Well, the date was October 30th, 1938. And the people crowding the parking lot had just heard Orson Welles' broadcast of the War of the Worlds. Totally unaware that it was not a nose broadcast, they came to plead with God on their knees because they felt the world was being invaded by an unstoppable conqueror. They thought that if only God could forgive them, maybe he would spare them from destruction. Of course, there were no Martians. That was all just pretend. But the day will come when the real conqueror will come. Jesus coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And only one thing will save us from a fair judgment from God. The blood of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.